The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 18, we'll begin with verse 9, read through verse 14 there. Luke chapter 18, beginning there with verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves be exalted. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O Lord, help us to have ears to hear, ears that would hear what you have for us, eyes to see what you have us to see, hearts open even now, Lord, to receive what you have for us. Move among us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So two men went up to the temple to pray. Isn't that a lovely thing? Two men entering into the sacred space understood and reserved as the house of God. And they've come to pray, to commune with the Almighty, to spend time focused in the presence of God. That's a pretty good way, a pretty good introduction to a parable, if ever there was one. Jesus wants to teach his disciples then, and us, his disciples now, about the dangers of trusting in oneself to be righteous while looking down our noses at others in contempt. What a better way to teach about such things than through a parable that that sort of celebrates exemplary prayer. So start the parable... Two men went up to the temple to pray. It doesn't take long, though, before this parable, the wheels get a little wobbly on it. Jesus says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, uh uh-oh, and one a tax collector, double uh uh-oh. This isn't just two ordinary men. Two fellows who've punched out, two run-of-the-men folks after work going to kneel in silent prayer in a candlelit corner of some chapel. It's a Pharisee and a tax collector. Well, I suppose that may be one way to teach about the dangers of self-righteousness and judging others. After all, we know about Pharisees, don't we? Don't we? Just the word itself. If you look up the word Pharisee in the dictionary, it is not listed by its historical understanding, but is often just called hypocrite. Right? The word itself conjures up all sorts of Sunday school lessons and images of ancient, uptight religious folks in dark colored robes with scowls scratched across their bearded faces. Our minds quickly turn to images of those who who go everywhere with big, thick, black Bibles tucked under their arms and Jesus fish on their tailgates who act like angry children in private and behave as if they've never read that Bible they keep tucked under their arms. Whenever we hear the word Pharisee, we already have a pretty good picture in our mind of where Jesus is going with this story. This Pharisee is going to turn out to be a hypocrite. And the Greek word literally meaning a play actor. One who wears a public persona of piety while privately parading his own depravity. That's how we know Pharisees, right? 
But before we, we just rubber stamp this guy, before we just send him on his way like the rest of those other Pharisees of his kind in our own created Christian tradition, let's hear him out. I mean, he's gone up to the temple to pray. Uh, he's at least in a holy space, maybe having a change of heart. Let's, let's at least listen to this prayer that Jesus says the Pharisee is praying. Jesus says the Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying. Isn't that a bit interesting? Standing by himself. Perhaps better, to himself. This Pharisee isn't standing on the street corner. Not on a soapbox, not with a megaphone in his hand waving his signs of judgment at the passers-by, no. He hasn't posted anything like on social media saying, headed to the temple for some quality God time, hashtag blessed, hashtag prayed up, hashtag Pharisee with the temple. No. There's nothing of this sort. This Pharisee seems to be keeping quietly to himself in prayer. Perhaps, I would argue, even maybe modeling a bit of what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, whenever you pray, Jesus says, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Pharisees praying to himself? Has there been a closet in the temple? I don't know, maybe he'd gone in it. I mean, it's a pair, but we don't want to stretch it too thin. But isn't it interesting? The sorts of things we'll pray to ourselves Especially those things we wouldn't dare pray out loud while others are around. When others aren't around to hear our prayers, when we think we've got God's ear all to ourselves, isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting some of the things we'll pray for? Lord, if it be thy will, transfer Susie from accounting next month. I really hate working with her. God, I'm thankful for all the things that you give me but if they can just figure out something to do with Gus down in Auburn, Lord, we'd really, really appreciate it. Jesus, I, I know this is bad, but I wish you'd do something about the neighbor's dog. I'm tired of cleaning up his mess. I'm tired of him barking all night and waking my kids up. Maybe you don't pray silly stuff like that. I'll go ahead and tell you I do. Not the Gus stuff. I don't care about that. Isn't it something? The things we'll pray when no one's listening. When we think we're praying all to ourselves. I'd like to say this Pharisee uh, prayed some pretty egregious prayers like that, maybe about his neighbor's dog, maybe about, I don't know, the latest sport college team in Israel, I don't know. I'd like to say he prayed some of that, but to be fair, his prayer isn't really all that bad. Did you read it? Did you hear it? God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. It maybe could have said that better. Thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of my income. I mean, he could have worded it better. He should have ran his prayer by somebody. I don't think God would appreciate you saying it that way. But it's a fine prayer, isn't it? After all, what's wrong with being thankful for who you are and what you've been given? Sounds a bit harsh, I know, to pray, God, I thank you, I'm not like those people. But it wasn't like he was talking about his good neighbors across the street, right? Not like he was talking about other Pharisees in his Torah studies classes. Not like those other good, tithing, fasting, God-fearing folks who gather together to read the scriptures and to pray. He wasn't talking about them. He was thankful he didn't turn out to be a thief. And who can fault him for that? How many of you who are parents, especially parents of grown children, haven't thanked God that they turned out halfway decent? That's not a bad thing to thank God for. This Pharisee is thankful that he didn't wind up on the wrong side of the law. That God saw him through his life to be a good, clean person. He's thankful he's not a rogue, an unjust, unrighteous person in opposition to that which is good and right in the world. And again, that's not a bad thing, is it? He's even thankful he's not an adulterer. An awful, hurtful sinner who's ruined his family and the lives of those in it. So yeah, we, we may want to find fault with his wording that he's not even like this tax collector, but the truth is, such a, such a sentiment would have likely received more than one amen from those listening to Jesus' parable. Thank you, I'm not like a tax collector. Amen to that, brother. And maybe, 
if we're honest, if we're really honest, we'd probably give them an amen too. I mean, they're tax collectors. Any of you aspire to collect people's taxes? Any of you aspire to pay your taxes? I mean, I know you want to. These tax collectors were despised folks. They were seen as collaborators with the oppressors, with Rome. They took advantage of those from whom they collected taxes. And what was worse, the Jewish tax collectors were seen as traitors. And they would collect more from their people and keep it for themselves. So when this, when this Pharisee prays, God, I thank you, I'm not even like this tax collector, it might have been a bit rude to say so, but most folks would have thought nothing of it. They would have been right there with him. They would have simply nodded their heads in agreement. That's right, those terrible, awful tax collectors. It's a good thing not to be like a tax collector. Wretched traitor that he is. So after offering his thanks to God for this, this Pharisee winds up his prayer with what we'll call a, a I don't know, a holy check-in with God to make sure God knows his credentials I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. He's got his ducks in a row. He's not just fasting once a week. Not on the prescribed fast days. Twice a week. Folks, I don't fast twice a year. Twice a week. He's one of those folks who doesn't just come to worship on Sunday morning. He comes to Sunday school, to Wednesday night prayer meeting, to Tuesday Bible study, to Thursday visitation, to every day of Bible school. He even goes to other churches for their revivals. He is that kind of person. And on top of his stellar fasting record, he's a tither. Got the tax statements to prove it. I suppose, I suppose we have to take the Pharisee here at his word. After all, he is just a character in Jesus' parable, but still... It's been my experience that when folks like to tell what all they do, they don't do all they tell. And sometimes it's just a little bit to cover up their insecurity. But if we take the Pharisee at his word, he's a standout man of faith. Here he is at prayer in the temple to himself without making a show of it. And he's thankful to God as he, that he's not like these other people. That God hasn't let him fall into a life of ill repute. While also blessing him enough that he can faithfully fast twice a week and consistently tithe. Isn't that good? Isn't that great? So why then does Jesus say, not the Pharisee, but the tax collector goes down to his home and is justified? How is it that this Pharisee exalted himself if he's just thanking God for what God has done for him. What is it about the tax collector's prayer that's so much better than the prayer of the Pharisee? Did you read it? Jesus tells us, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. This tax collector can't even come up all the way into the temple. Can hardly find himself worthy to be in the same place as the Pharisee. Jesus is sure to tell us, far off, standing far off. Perhaps he knew the weight of his betrayal, the soul-crushing cost of swindling folks out of their money in order to line his own pockets. Maybe he knew his righteousness could never even come close to that of the Pharisee. I suspect the tax collector in Jesus' story didn't even fast at all. And the few times he did show up for service, when the plate came by, he thought about taking a little bit out of it. I don't know. Perhaps he recognizes his own lowliness, brought on by this terrible vocational choice. So he beats his chest as a sign of extreme mourning and repentance and cries out to God, Be merciful to me, a sinner. It's a simple prayer. No eloquence to it whatsoever. A prayer of confession. A pleading for mercy in the light of one's own realization that one strayed from God. It's the prayer we all make, I hope, at some point in our lives. A prayer that we will all say, hopefully, more than once. It's the prayer that grounds us, 
reminds us that we cannot do or be anything on our own. And it's the prayer that reminds us that we all are truly in need of God's mercy and grace. Because no matter how hard we may try on our own, no matter how many schemes we may devise in our lives to save ourselves, each and every one of us will fall short. And we will over and over and over again. And this prayer from this tax collector is the kind of prayer that calls us back to the realization that while we may always fall short, God's mercy doesn't. That God's mercy is sufficient to fill us with God's love all the more. So the Pharisee prays and thanks God for the ways God has provided for him. Kept him free from a life of treachery and debauchery. And the tax collector just prays for mercy. Yet Jesus says only, only the tax collector returns home justified. Why? Why? You know why. You know why. Because we don't have to really interpret the Pharisees' words at all, do we? Yeah, he, maybe he is thankful. Maybe he's genuine and thanking God for not letting him become like these other people. But I know this Pharisee's heart. I know it, even though he's a, a fictional character in a story Jesus tells, I know this Pharisee's heart. I know it because too often it's my own heart. Too often I'm the one praying to myself, God, I'm sure glad I'm not like those people. Of course, it's not always in a temple. Not always in the sanctuary in a moment of called prayer. Sometimes, sometimes it's in the car with the windows rolled up, waiting in line, in that line of traffic, trying to merge onto the interstate. And he's standing there with his sign. I hesitate to ever read that sign, because I know if I look over there, he's coming to my door. So I say, God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful I'm not like him. Sometimes it's in the parking lot, waiting for my wife to come out of the store, when I see a woman bent back, searching the pavement, looking as if she's lost a contact, but you know what she's looking for? Half-smoked cigarettes. They call it duck hunting. She goes over to the ash can, picks up the lid, looking for the half-smoked cigarettes in there. Anything, some small token just to slake her addiction. And I just think, oh, I'm glad I'm not like that. It's when I hear about another crazy politician, another sleazy criminal arrested on charges that would make my stomach turn, another image of a family fleeing for their lives when I pray, God, I'm thankful I'm not like those people. Because we all have those people in our lives, don't we? Those tax collectors, we're thankful we're nothing like. And when we're praying to ourselves, when no one else can really hear our confession, we say, God, I'm thankful I'm not like those people. But here's the thing. Here's the thing I'm coming to learn more and more every single day. Do you know why the tax collector was justified and not the Pharisee? Because the tax collector isn't play acting. The tax collector knows the truth. We all stand in need of the mercy of God. We are all sinners in need of the grace of God. We are all, each and every one of us, no better than anyone else. The tax collector recognized that. The tax collector recognized his need for God's mercy. While the Pharisee looked around for somebody he was better than. And so Jesus says, the tax collector went down to his home justified rather than the Pharisee. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. I pray that I find new ways, that God shows me new ways every day to be humbled. 
And that's my prayer for you. It's not always an easy prayer. It's not always one I want to pray. Because I'd much rather say, God, I'm glad I'm not like those folks. But the prayer that Christ calls from us, is the prayer that says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, just like everybody else, just like me. What prayer do you have to offer to God today? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy on us when we pray like the Pharisees. Lord, I know I'm going to do it as much as I don't want to, as much as I tell myself not to. I know I will. So Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on all of us. Well, we need your mercy. We need your grace. To be reminded, Lord, that none of us is better than anyone else. And that's the beautiful thing about the gospel. You call us all, every last one of us, to your love, your grace, and your mercy, despite how much we are not worthy. So Holy Spirit, move in our presence. Help us, Lord, to pray the prayer you call from us to be attentive to your spirit and the ways you would have us to go. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.